this is Linda Shea. I'm co-founder of a crypto fund called Scalar Capital. I'm very passionate about crypto, and I'm excited to give an overview of what it is. Uh, I also want to preface this talk with saying this is not investment advice. So I wanted to start off on a personal note about the events that led to my interest in Bitcoin. So my parents are immigrants from China, and I grew up in the United States, and I was constantly hearing stories about my parents' childhood. In particular, some of the stories that really stood out to me were stories from my mom and her family. So her family was really well-educated and fairly well-off, but this didn't align with the communist ideals at the time. And so during the Cultural Revolution, um, my mom's side of the family actually had their home raided and had their property seized. So when I came across Bitcoin, I was really fascinated with this idea of unseizable assets. Another event was that my parents were often sending money back home to China. And so I was constantly seeing the inefficiencies of the banking system where it would be just really expensive and time consuming for them to actually send money back home. And I also ended up working at AIG in the risk management department after the financial crisis. And so I really got to see some of the inner workings of the financial system and through that got pretty interested in decentralized systems. As I mentioned, the banking system is very inefficient and expensive. So moving money around actually requires the trust of centralized third parties. So because of this, your funds aren't always accessible when the banks are closed. As I mentioned, it can be expensive to actually transfer funds and it takes significant time. So I think a really great example of this is actually in 2008 when Morgan Stanley needed an injection of capital to prevent them from collapsing. And so Mitsubishi UFJ actually agreed to um, send them $9 billion. But since the money was needed urgently and banks were closed in the US and Japan, they actually had to write a $9 billion physical check and hand it in person to Morgan Stanley executives. So this shows that even uh, large financial institutions have issues moving funds around. So not only uh, is the banking system inefficient, but you actually have many people that can't actually access the banking system. So we're pretty fortunate in the US to have a relatively strong banking system, but there are actually over 2 billion unbanked people worldwide. You can't always rely on government-backed currency too. So we're seeing hyperinflation in Venezuela right now. And in the past, we saw hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, where at one point, the $100 trillion note was actually issued. So with all of these issues, there was a quest for digital money for decades. So Bitcoin really wasn't the first digital money out there. There were many other attempts at it. And we really saw Bitcoin kind of form a lot of the ideas that had been developed over time. But in 1983, actually, a world-renowned cryptographer, David Chom, introduced the idea of digital money. And he started a company called DigiCash in 1990, which ended up declaring bankruptcy in 1998. Another company, eGold, started in 1996, and they were allowing for instant transfer of gold ownership. But that was suspended due to legal issues. So these attempts at digital money actually ended up failing because there were centralized points of control. At the time, we really needed these centralized parties, though, because we hadn't figured out how to solve the double spend problem yet. So the double spend problem is actually for digital money that the same money can be spent more than once. So if I have $100 and I spend it with an online merchant, I shouldn't be able to spend that same $100 with another online merchant. And so at the time, we actually needed these centralized parties to keep track of all these transactions on their own ledgers to know whether or not there had been a double spend. There was a key breakthrough in digital money when Satoshi Nakamoto released Bitcoin in 2009. What's really interesting is that no one actually knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Uh, it could be a male, female, or a group of people. And I think that's one of the lures of Bitcoin. Uh, Satoshi published a white paper, which is essentially a document that provides technical details. So within the white paper, Satoshi talks about a distributed public ledger. This is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer ledger where everyone can agree on the history of the transactions and agree on the state of the ledger. And so we refer to this as a blockchain. In this industry, you'll also hear the term crypto. Uh, so this actually came from the word cryptography. Um, but in this context, it actually means using cryptography, math, and computer science to make sure currency can't be faked, the record is real and immutable, which means it can't be altered, and the owner is uniquely identified. And so uh, I got this uh, definition from a previous A16C talk, which I really liked. So within this system, miners are extremely important. Miners are computers that validate network transactions. 
So they're solving these really complex mathematical problems. And the first one to solve this mathematical problem gets the right to write to the public ledger. And so this is really complex computational problem. And so the output is really difficult to produce, but easy for others to verify. And so this is known as proof of work. So proof of work is essentially a consensus mechanism where everyone can agree on the state of the transactions and they can agree on the public ledger without having to trust anyone. And so this enables trustless consensus. And so it's really oversimplified to describe this as these complex mathematical problems, but essentially know that that's a very high level description of what's going on in the space. So why would anyone actually want to spend all these resources validating these transactions? Well, actually, when you win the right to write to the public ledger, you actually receive Bitcoin as reward. So it can be quite profitable. And we're actually seeing that right now where there's really intense competition in the mining space. So in the early days, you actually had anyone able to just link up their computer and start validating transactions. So anyone could be a miner. But over time, it's actually required to mine with ASICs, which are application-specific integrated circuits. So this is specialized hardware built for a specific purpose. And in this context, it's built specifically for Bitcoin mining. And so you end up having these stacks of ASICs in these rooms that are air conditioned and they're consuming immense amounts of electricity. Sometimes you'll actually see stats where it says that the total amount of electricity consumed by Bitcoin is actually on par with a small nation. I actually had an experience with this myself because I bought an ASIC and I wanted to mine Bitcoin. And so when I started turning on my ASIC, it was so loud, it sounded like a vacuum cleaner going off at all times. The machine itself was, um, was so hot that I actually ended up having to move this outside of my apartment into a room that was air conditioned full time. So this isn't as accessible for regular people to just start mining on the network in Bitcoin anymore. Bitcoin was really just the beginning. In the early days when Bitcoin got created, there were some copycats of Bitcoin. People were trying to just go after the same use case of digital money or being a store of value. But over time, we really saw more and more crypto assets get created. So on a website called CoinMarketCap, there's 1,600 crypto assets that are actually listed on there. And there's a total market cap of $400 billion. So this is no longer a small industry. Ethereum came along in 2015, and that was a really pivotal moment. Ethereum is a smart contracts platform. And so what is a smart contract? Well, the way I like to actually describe a smart contract is I find this image really helpful. On the left side in gray, you have this image of a legal contract. A legal contract is essentially a bunch of if-then conditions. So if this event happens, then make sure this event happens. And lawyers are responsible for uh, writing this up and executing it. Well, you can really convert a lot of this logic into just code. So the code itself can start self-executing. So on the right, you have a smart contract where this logic is essentially just written out in code. And so a smart contract are programs that are executed by a network of computers. So when I talked about Bitcoin, you had these miners that were validating network transactions. Well, in Ethereum, you have miners that are validating the code in the smart contract. And so what this really enables is you can have transactions that don't require a middleman. And these smart contracts are actually the building blocks for all the other applications that get created. I also want to say that it doesn't have to be legal contracts. That was just kind of what this example was, but there are many other things that can be created through this. A key difference to Ethereum is that the founders are actually known and active in the community, whereas Satoshi isn't known, and we're not really sure if Satoshi is even active anymore. The Ethereum founders raised $18 million in Bitcoin in an initial crowd sale. So crowd sale is essentially a public way to fundraise. One thing that the founders really do is push forward technological innovations on Ethereum. So as I mentioned, uh, in Bitcoin, there's a consensus mechanism called proof of work. This consumes a lot of electricity. But the founders of Ethereum actually are trying to move the uh, platform forward to something called proof of stake instead of proof of work. And so without getting too much into the weeds, uh, proof of stake essentially allows people to have more skin in the game and requires lower electricity consumption. So the point being that the founders really try to push forward innovation on the network. There are thousands of tokens built on Ethereum. So a token is a digital asset that can represent anything from a real world item like gold to something like stocks, to something like bonds, voting rights, or utility rights, rights to use the platform. Anyone can create an Ethereum token. So there's this image of token factory on the right, 
you can just go to this website and you can just create a token really easily. So you just have to enter the total supply, the name of your token, the number of decimal places it's divisible by, and the symbol. It's a really easy process. You can just create a token through this way. And so there's clearly a low barrier to entry. And so that's why you're really seeing thousands of tokens out there. In order for the tokens to actually be valuable, though, you need to make sure the network itself is actually valuable. So imagine if Twitter just launched a token in the early days when they didn't have any users. Then the token itself wouldn't have been valuable at that point. So know that there's a lot more to actually making sure that this token is useful. You'll hear something called decentralized applications or dApps. These are applications that run on decentralized networks. So there's no centralized party that's operating this application. Oftentimes, you'll see that there are tokens required to actually access dApps, but this isn't always the case, but it's a pretty popular trend you're seeing lately. Since there's thousands of tokens out there, not all of them can just get listed on decentralized exchanges, so there needs to be a way to trustlessly exchange these tokens. And so what a decentralized exchange is, is you can essentially exchange tokens through smart contracts, so you no longer need to custody funds with a third party. 